I believe we're living in an underappreciated renaissance and golden age of the shooter genre. The first golden age being the days of Doom 2 to Quake to Unreal Tournament on the PC and capping off with Halo on the original Xbox. It seems the genre then fell into an EA Sports-esque slump of if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Don't get me wrong, games like Killzone, Halo 2, Call of Duty, Modern Warfare 1 and 2, later Black Ops and Battlefield Bad Company 2, Battlefield 3, continually refined and were great in their time. The look back on it all is to see that they began repeating themselves to a the designers and developers, possibly hamstrung by the publisher's belief in a myth called a sure thing, refused to break out of their bubble, which, as much as I'd love to come to their defense and say every time they tried, they were rejected by the audience, a la Gears of War judgment, I think the hostility on experimentation came from gamers seeing through so-called experimentation, nothing more than a copy-paste design of that day's king. Back then, it was COD. Even the fans were arguably bored by the entire enterprise by the time 2010 rolled around and we were stuck in the Call of Duty era of annual releases. Halo had sharpened the saw with reach, but the ceiling had ostensibly been reached to Vinny Vitty Bitchy. We shooter fans said with a proud but resigned sigh, as we hung up our helmets and dog tags and medals and prestige systems, we all chanted as one solemn 3 a.m. night. They did mean something. Those games. Something new. Something different. At least in some way they paved the road for the future. And that is until the Great Awakening began. This awakening to me is marked by two events. Doom 2016, the confirmation that foundational game design still matters, and Titanfall 2. That is, that while foundational game design mechanics still matter, yes, there's still a lot of experimentation and growth that can take place in the interim within the shooter genre. Now, like all advances of any capacity in any field, there were links to the chain before the breakthrough. We can't pretend like Call of Duty, Modern Warfare 1 and 2, World of War, Black Ops 2 weren't important trailblazers toward both refinement and the eventual resignation of each shooter beginning to run together like the last few seasons of The Simpsons. The idea seemed blanked. When that occurs, there's two options. Do as Picasso instructed, master the rules, then throw them out, or get back to the basics of love. What's interesting to me is Rogue Company is a bit of both. Yes, it bought in very late to the hero shooter craze that was the offspring of Fall of the Hype Train gaming industry, in this case League to Destiny to Overwatch. But unlike the other games at the twilight period of this period of looter shooter hero shooter to the dawn of the BR, it doesn't cut the hero part down to tiny increments of power to be selectively utilized to change the dynamics of battle. Sure, this works in some capacity in Apex, but Apex has the benefit of being an adroit shooter above all else. The constant struggles against over and under tuning are a direct result of this half measure of the hero shooter. Rogue Company is no half measure. Each rogue is equipped with a passive, tactical, and generous ultimate. The tacticals are equipped in the style of vendors in a a la CSGO. These are grenades, flashbangs, EMPs, and, for once, all of these are devastating in their capacity. Capacity. So many games give the illusion of options that boil down to just shoot your way through. A grenade in Rogue Company may get the down, but an EMP can win the objective. A stun grenade can create a team wipe. Player's passive tends to be more in the apex style of small strategic bonuses that matter in the clutch, but could also be a more League or Battleborn style implementation of abilities such as Kestrels making more cash per down, creating a fast track to a fully geared out character faster than anyone, or Anvil's ability to neutralize gadgets and tacticals combined with his immunity to stun and blinding effects, creating a late game tank of utilitarian nature. Unlike Apex's experiment, with tanks, just give them some damage immunity, Jim. Rogue Company is designed to be objective and respawn based. On good Rogue Company nights, I get peak Battleborn vibes. That is teams picking against one another's rogues to create a surprisingly deep combination of point-counterpoint within a match. 
Unfortunately, this is also where the much maligned Battleborn vibes return. Row Company is not a peak franchise in terms of player counts, and outside of initial buzz has not seemed to make many inroads. While matchmaking tends to be snappy enough not to be a chore, even if at times it can go up to 5 minutes plus without finding a match and quitters tend to plague the game, one does find themselves playing for or against the same players over the stretch of an evening. I find this doubly frustrating as hi res was absolutely proactive in this effort of player base and matchmaking. The game is cross-platform and available on everything from the Switch and last-gen consoles to current gen and PC, all free to play all with an in-game friend system that's easy to manage and navigate, unlike say trying to do crossplay in Halo Infinite, which can be quite difficult. Xbox players and PC players share lobbies, usually it's 50-50 for me. I can play at 120 FPS on my Xbox Series X and have never struggled with performance outside of audio bugs, crashes, and just, well, bugs. Never entirely game-breaking, but they can happen more than one would like in a PvP-focused game. Severe, handicap, unplayable, lag, rubber banding, just bizarre. But Apex still has this problem with many more players in a much larger budget. The game has zero pay to win mechanics, the microtransactions are there, but I've never felt push nor that the marketplace overly caters to whales. Nor was the store always constantly in my face like it can be in some other microtransaction live service based games. Nearly everything can be bought with the free to play currency rogue tokens which, I'll admit, are painfully slow to grind, but it's an option. I'd also wager that on top of player counts, revenue is becoming an issue. As in the latest season, video advertisements for 75 rogue tokens were added to the game, leaving me leaving me with the worst of all Battleborn reminders, watching games one loves die. But unlike Battleborn, we're not out $60 in the legally questionable practice of online-only games being discontinued permanently. Now on the topic of microtransactions and negatives, what's strange about Rogue Company, as far as those negatives and microtransactions are concerned, is that Rogue Company lacks a nucleus that brings it all together. There's a zany group of rogues, okay, cool. They battle each other, neat, and, well that's really it. It's like Apex or Overwatch or Battleborn, but without any of the world building or lore. Most players would argue, oh that's a small thing when weighed against the gameplay, and they'd be right, but it is a thing. It's a necessary garnish or a bit of pepper on an excellent cut of meat. Similar to Splitgate, which I'd argue is better than Halo Infinite's multiplayer right now. There's nothing to move it beyond technically precise and well crafted. And in this world of media licensing, Star Wars the musical, not building a world and story with distinct relationships, again, Battleborn, the characters, actively talking smack to one another mid-match or flirting with each other. This imbibed the game with a sense of life, even in the midst of a drawn-out PvP fray. I feel like Battleborn was really the example of doing this right. It hurts the player's ability to... It, it hurts the... Rather, it hurts the game's ability to draw players to skins like Fortnite, which has mastered this with brand tie-ins and Kevin. As the train for California Way was leaving the station with the last of its 49ers, the few miners remaining seem to have said, forget clothes and food, I just need my pickaxe. Row Company, to my mind, does the pickaxing, aka the gameplay, is great, and it's better than most other shooters right now. But I, And in fact, I believe it to be the single best third-person cover-based shooter PvP game out right now. But without the same world building, without some character development, and even the hint of a story and lore beyond, we're left with kooky characters in an endless arena, a sort of dark tone that never quite hits the right note, with the occasional limited time mode having to do with mercenaries or cash or money making, but still not. Like you're in the ballpark, but what is this universe really? And the worst thing, and, and one of the worst LTMs that they release is called Battle Zone, which is them flirting with a 3v3 BR. I don't know what they're doing there. All of the ranked, all of the competitive style cues for Rogue Company don't involve respawning, and so they're going. So they're going for that Valorant. They're going for that CS:GO style competitive edge, and I don't think this is a game where that works. I think that Rogue Company needs to really look into ranked strikeout, and if they're gonna do a BR, do a BR. It kind of works. It kind of doesn't. I love King of the Hill. The fun 
honest for me is King of the Hill. That is what works with Rogue Company, is an objective and re recent balance changes and a drawing in of the player count is beginning to make the queues inhibitive even for the more fun limited time modes. Which all leads to the self-fulfilling vicious cycle of we need money, the only way to make money is we need more players, we can't get more players without spending money. I know high res intends to support this game. They have supported it. I think it's the second year now. I hope they continue to do so because it is so much more satisfying than most of the gritting teeth 14 year olds for hire that inhabit all the shooters beyond this one. But Rogue Company has an identity crisis that's tough to crack. And that identity crisis is one of the ways I believe that the game is struggling to make inroads. Which is all to say that Rogue Company has a nebulous identity crisis that's tough to crack. It's not a copycat game, but it's not entirely original either. Their limited time modes, skins, and seasons have a distinct lack of theme that is all their own. For anyone that argues Fortnite did this with success, they forget that Fortnite began with Save the World. Most of the events and skins that made the game crack the 13 year olds on iPhone was themed around Save the World originally, the Storm being the primary villain in Save the World. In the words of the 45th president, it makes a difference, and in terms of checking all the boxes toward a great game, sometimes these unseen and seemingly tertiary forces can make all the difference, especially in terms of revenue and player counts. With that being said, Rogue Company is my go-to shooter. More than Apex, more than Halo Infinite, more than any other game right now, it encapsulates what I used to love about shooters. It's time to kill as fast, rewarding flanks and clean headshots. Unlike Apex is hard to find Kraber and total lack of one-shot kill weapons. There's just enough health on a rogue and enough tactical ability acquired throughout a match that reversals and big plays are possible and reward downs quickly. Escaping a near death, the flank and team wipe is as satisfying as the cracking of a pistachio nut. A nut that most games in this age of data target fixation is often cold for the sake of a 1.0 KD and a 1.0 win to loss record. It's there in Halo. It's there in Mario Kart, it's there in Overwatch. Yes, they've mastered matchmaking for the sake of repetitive sameness. The algorithm defines and judges all to be equally adequate. Rogue Company offers a surrender option. Sometimes it's balanced, often there's a couple good players and a couple of new players, and it becomes a haphazard shoot 'em up, and I love it for this. And it's not the statistically stratified hierarchy of sameness that drives professional esports and the larger populated online shooters. See, back in my day of going uphill both ways in the snow, Gears of War was the short term king of the heavy hitters, a smash hit that saw two sequels continue to improve on the game. This peaked, in my opinion, with Gears of War 3. And I know the loyalists are out there for Gears of War 1, and I respect what you see as a more tactical game, but for me, 3 was the essence of what Gears could be. Gears 3 ran smooth on Xbox 360, and better yet, the gameplay had been smooth of all blemishes, warts, and wrinkles. Going to cover, around it, then moving, went from three buttons combined with movement input to one button to leap over. Chainsaw battles were turned into quick time events. Power weapons spawned more often, but could also be matched by a precision use and speed of the default loadout. I never imagined that Gears 3 was the peak, but 10 years later, 4 and 5 are not that much different than that game which dropped in 2011. So, much to my surprise, there exists another diamond in the rough. Waving back to us is the memory hole of Battle Something. And that's what I thought Gears would be in 2022. Faster, sleeker, meaner. Arenas. Arenas and heroes are five minutes to learn, a thousand hours to master. Arenas follow either the box corridor simplicity of frontline and flank, or the more spiraling spokes on a wheel of the newer maps. But they always retain Rogue Company's essential idea. Assault and Defense. This is a game about holding down zones, holding down territory. The right mixture of rogues may or may not break a match, but they are more important than the perceived simplicity. Much like the arenas themselves, appearances can be deceiving. Civilization or Catan can be boiled down into turn-based resource management, just as shooters can often devolve into get behind the other guy. But Rogue Company sets a stage. Breacher, Defender, Duelist, Snipers, and Supports. And really, I'd rather see this just be the latter three, as all all rogues possess hybrid abilities and there is still an emphasis put on third person action and at times first person shooter skills. A breacher is a frontline pusher. Defenders Kurito's front lines, and I'd argue snipers and supports fit into this role here just as well. 
similar to Destiny's Trials, Battleborn Incursion, Rainbow Six Siege, Apex, etc., getting a pick at the right time and in the right place sets the tactical pendulum swinging one way or another. That combined with a proper support as in the previous list, who can set up a defensive front to allow for an expert flank and all the glory. But with the quick TTK allowed by shotguns and SMGs, the one-shot capable snipers, it feels like a refreshing fallback to a bygone glorious day of Penta multi-kills. Double kill, triple kill. Battle lines are drawn in real and the eye in the sky would reveal a simulation up there with Battlefront or Halo in terms of the ebb and flow of well-selected rogues and well-match made battles. Adding to the strategic play is just how meaty weapons feel across the board. Snipers, again, one hit. A thing strangely void in many shooters these days, so it bears repeating. Shotguns can team wipe. Shotguns require excellent positioning and great timing, but can just play and hold ground. SMGs shred. It's hard to think of a game that has a more balanced of array of weapons. And I mean that. Everything is just generally powerful. Shooting well, regardless of weapon choice, is going to see one getting knocked, getting kills. And unlike Overwatch or other hero shooters that lack a PvE mechanic, the most significant significantly unlike Apex Legends, there's an unlimited level cap, rogue mastery levels, weapon mastery levels, and season passes. There is consistently something to attain, and while it's not as robust to say Battleborn or Destiny at their best, there's still more than just queuing over and over to keep the player busy in the long term. I'm still playing Rogue Company a year on, largely because weapon mastery and rogue mastery is enough of a carrot for me. Rogue Company is a game where I felt the most limited in our out of three scale, because Rogue Company does have matchmaking troubles. Rogue Company does have network issues, and, and bugs exist like the latest edition of Skyrim a decade later. It's just a part of life, it's sometimes hilarious, sometimes frustrating and detracting. It lacks a coherent nucleus to center the franchise. Yet, I believe Rogue Company harkens back to arcade shooters of yesteryear that were really about blowing each other up and allowing epic plays just by positioning and shooter skills. Like Doom 2016, what once was lost is found again. Rogues is a gameplay loop that feels gloriously nostalgic, while also being the refined and sharpened edge that I imagine Gears of War would become, a cover-based third-person shooter that feels as responsive to control and as fast to navigate as if it were a first-person shooter. That's the high highest praise I can give this game, and why I wish so many more people were noticing it. Rogue Company was made by Hi-Rez, who does first-person shooters, yet they were able to translate their first-person knowledge into a third-person game that feels pioneering. Rogue Company is bizarrely ignored for this, just by lack of honest recognition for what is to my mind a step forward for the genre of third-person shooter games. As someone who has spent thousands of hours inside each of the Gears, Rogue Company is what I thought Gears would be and would become in 2022. The fact then is, Rogue Company is what third-person shooters are in 2022 and need to look to be like from here on out. A 2 out of 3.